What's up? Uh, so I was going to ask you about e eternal uh, beginning. Dude, man, what? are you stuck on this, man? It's been I'm how not long? stuck on it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand it. Yeah, but what is it? What is it about eternal beginning that's fascinated you? I, I wouldn't say it's fascinating. I'm trying to under understand it. Good luck understanding it. So, okay, I, I used to be a biblical Unitarian. Uh, Unitarian. Yep. I'm slowly coming out of that, and my understanding is that Jesus came forth from the Father. What does that mean? That he came forth. That means uh, from what? his. Somehow he was residing within the Father, and he came forth. Even from, what does it mean for him to reside within the Father? Because the Father is not a physical being, right? A material being. So what does it mean residing in the Father? The, this word was inside of inside the Father. Of I, I guess it, within the spirit of the Father, and it came forth. What does it mean to be in the spirit? Because the spirit is immaterial. It's not material. It's not physical. It's not corporeal. The, well, that, that's my understanding. I, I guess it's hard to explain, but exactly. so my understanding is somehow Jesus resided within the Father, and then he came forth from here, his own here. being. I don't think you're getting it when I'm asking the question. Reside in the Father. But if the father is not a physical, material, corporeal being, what can reside in him when there's nothing material in God for something to reside in? What do you mean reside in? See, like here, water resides in this bottle. My heart resides in my body. My brain resides in my head. Well, some think I don't have a brain. But God is not a material, physical, corporeal being. When you say resides in him, in what exactly? God by nature is invisible, immaterial, incorporeal, right? <clears throat> I, I, I guess it would have to be in his mind, like this word was... His mind is not physical, right? So even when you say the mind of God, it is not a concrete material thing, something tangent, like a cup, and then there's something in that cup. Right. See, I'm, at, I'm getting you to see that when you talk about God, he's beyond comprehension, even apart from the Trinity. So even the language we use, because we're creatures who are limited to time, space, and place, we then define things from our framework, from our vantage point. So I say, within God. All right. But then if I take a step back and think, but well, what do I mean within God? There, there's nothing in God in a literal material sense because God is not a material body. So when you take a step back and you start thinking, God really is unlike anything creation. Even the language I use must be metaphorical language. And I can't press the language to its conclusion because then I'm going to confuse myself even more. Then you're on the right path. So the more you confused you get, the more <clears throat> you are getting it. Right. Yeah, I guess going from the Bible, all we can say is God is a spirit. Yeah. And even angels are spirits. Satan is a spirit, but they're not spirits the way God is spirit, right? It, aren't angel spirits? Hebrews 1 7. Yes, they're ministering spirits. Uh, but God is spirit, so it doesn't mean angels exist the way God exists. So God is a spirit like angels? No. If right. you think God is a spirit like angels, you got problems. No. Because even when you said God is spirit, you're taking it from John 4 24. But if you read the context of John 4, 24, Jesus said God is spirit in the context of you don't need to go to a location to worship God because wherever you are, you have access to God by the Holy Spirit because God is a kind of spirit who's not bound to space and place. So you have access to him wherever you're at. That's the context of the statement that you just gave me, John 4, 24. God is a spirit and those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. What was the context? When the Samaritan woman asked, well, you Jews say that we need to worship in the temple, but our fathers say we worship here on the mount, Mount Jerzim. Where do we worship him? Neither on the mountain nor in the temple. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit of truth. In other words, you don't need to go to a location to find God, because wherever you are, God is present. He's before you. So so Jesus uh, was always existed alongside the Father? Even that alongside, you see? If we press it, it assumes temporality place and space right long side right well if god is spirit and he has no sides what does it mean to exist alongside <laughs> i know you're getting confused dude but you're in good company
Don't be frustrated. That's my point. The deeper you think, the more you're going to get baffled because you're dealing with a being unlike anything in creation. Yeah. So I, I've read the earliest church fathers. Yep. It, it seems like they're making the case that Jesus came forth from God. Almost. It depends on which father, because you had some fathers who were steeped in scripture and philosophy. And because of their philosophy, they actually assumed God being a substance had a body. I just did a session on Tertullian when did I, two days ago. Tertullian said that God is a substance and substance are bodies. And that's now Greek philosophy, not biblical theology. That doesn't mean he's a heretic. No, it just means they were grappling and wrestling with what the Bible taught and trying to understand it in the philosophical thought processes and categories of their day. Remember, a lot of them were steeped in Greek philosophy, right? Whether it's Stoicism, Epicurean, you know, Epicureans, right? Whatever it is, you know, Platonic thinking, you name it. They all came out of that world view and they were relearning, unlearning, right? Learning afresh because of their Christian experience, which was transforming their paradigm. So at times they got too philosophical because they tried to explain what the Bible taught about God in that philosophical worldview. And at times they went to the extreme. Tertullian would be an example. He actually believed that God being a substance had a body. So that within God's body substance, there was the reason. The reason came forth and then took on a body of its own. Well, that's not biblical. That's philosophical. That does that mean he's a heretic? No, it just simply means he is struggling and wrestling with how to explain what he sees in Scripture. Father is uncreated. Son is uncreated. Spirit is uncreated. But the Son is begotten, but he's not created. And if God is a substance, I've been taught that substances have bodies. Does that mean God has a body? But today in the 21st century, who thinks that substances require bodies? Yeah, material substances, substances within the material realm would require bodies or we would say shape, space, and place, but not the creator of all space and shape and place, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess honestly in my mind, I'm picturing God having a body, but I, I, exactly. I don't actually I don't actually believe that though. You know why? Because you're a creature, you're finite. And like me, a creature finite, when we hear terms, we start processing those terms and imagining those terms from our frame of reference, from our particular experience. To say in, with, automatically we think space, shape, body. Here, this is alongside each other. This is alongside of me. There is liquid in this can but god is not a can and he's not liquid and he's not a bodily <clears throat> spatial being so all these lang all these terms are going to be analogical metaphorical pressing it literally you're going to confuse yourself more i i know this terms would would fall under the same but wouldn't that take away from jesus being a son if he didn't actually come from his father no it only means that Jesus is a son because the divine nature that he has originates from the father, not that he came out of the father. Because, again, you interpret it sonship and begetting from your framework. I begot a son because I begot him, not another. He's my son. But God is not you. He's not physical. He doesn't physically beget a son. So why would you assume that for Jesus to be truly begotten of the Father, he must come out of the Father because that's assuming your frame of reference to be normative for a being who's unlike you. Why do you assume that? Well, well, how can the, the Father be the source if the Son was always there? Do you assume that if something is a source of another, it has to be later in time? There you go again, assuming your frame of reference to be normative for a being who created time. How do you know that? Are you timeless to know that if the father is a source, then the son must be later? You'd only know that if you exist as God. But the last time I checked, you're not God. So how do you know this is true? Well, well if he's the source. So there you go. It, it, how do you it, know if he's the source that implies that the thing must be later if it derives its nature from the source? You didn't answer the question. Well, well, well that's how a, a source works. According to who? Creation? See, you begged the question again. Well, not, well, I, 
I, I can only use human logic because that's all I have. You know what I mean? And that's the problem. That's why when God tells you my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not my ways, I guess that's not in your Bible. So why don't you delete Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Remove that from your Bible. Right. My thoughts I, are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. But you just insisted your ways and thoughts must be God's ways and thoughts. Well, hold on, God. I only have my frame of reference, human logic. And if one thing is a source of another, then the thing which derives what it has from a source must be later. So it must be true of you. And you know what God says? Sucks being you. Right. Sucks being you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm gonna have to study this more. Uh, yeah, thanks Isaiah for 55, 8 to 9. Can you read that for me, buddy? Okay. I got it. Read it for me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Yeah, but you just impose your thoughts on God. Yeah, well, if something's a source, okay, and? Well, well, I mean, the, the only logic I have is the human logic that I have. I'm just trying and to so, and God understand. Just told you, God just told you, take your human logic and shove it, right? Did you just read that? My thoughts are not your thoughts, right? Yeah. So you want to reread it again? Remind yourself, take your logic and shove it. I I got you. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to understand well, it. Put it together. I'm pressing you. I'm just push back. Don't don't take it personally. I'm just no, you're, back. no, you're you're fine. You need to be sanctified and have your mind purged. If you believe the Bible is true, if you don't believe the Bible is true, then you can believe whatever you want. But if you believe the Bible is true, the Bible already told you in advance what not to do with God and His Word. Do not impose your thoughts, your ways on God, thinking God acts like you and thinks like you. He's already told you that in Scripture. So if you don't believe the Bible, that's okay. It's not your authority. Find you another religion. But since you are coming to the Bible and submitting to it, then you cannot say, well, hold on, God. I only have human reasoning. And he just told you, shove it. Stop imp <clears throat> imposing your human reasoning on me. I just told you my thoughts are not your thoughts. What are you not getting? That's what God is saying, right? Yeah. So you're saying, oh, well, if he's the source, then that which derives what it has from the source must be later. Even, even with that said, that's not technically true. That's not true. I'm going to now show you why that's not true. Even using temporal finite creation that's unlike God. So when I give you the analogy, don't think I'm saying God is this way. I'm saying even what you said is not true. Let's take the father and son analogy. I don't know if you have children. Do you have children? Yeah. I'm going to watch me so I can put you up on the screen. Your oldest son, how old is he? Or oldest child? Is it a boy or a girl? A uh, boy, 16. Okay. So you begot your son. So that means using human thinking, he's later in time, right? Co correct. You begot, right? Correct. No, he's not later in time because without him, you're not a father. So how old are you as a father? Oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. How old are you as a father? I, I, I'm only as old as my oldest, 16. Yeah. How can you be as old as your firstborn when you're the source of your firstborn? So you just confused me. That's a contradiction. Well, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm older than him, but I've only been a, fa no, you, you can, a father. You can only be a father if you have a son. Yeah. So, no, you're not older than him as a father. Not you're wrong. correct. We're the same age. But how? How can you be as old as him as a father when you're the source of his existence? So you just created a contradiction. Well, because you can only be his father as, as long as you have a child. Yeah, but my, hold on. you're still the source of the child. So how are you as old as him? See, you're not making no sense. My mind doesn't comprehend. Well, well, I'm, I'm older than him as a person. No, my, my title oh. as a, a father can only happen having oh. a son. So how can you be as old as your son as a father? I didn't say as a bachelor. Right. How can you be as old as your son as a father? You're as old as your firstborn. When you're the source of your firstborn, that makes no sense to me. See, man, uh, that's contradiction. So I don't think you're a father. You're a liar. I don't think you're a father. There's right. no way you as a father can be as old as your firstborn. Impossible. So now refute me. No, I, I, see what, I, I see what you're saying. I understand the argument. So you need your son to be an actual father. And you're dependent on him just as much as he's dependent on you for him to exist as a son. Right. So it's interdependence, isn't it? Yeah, the, the same with a husband and wife. A husband and wife would be the same. Well, yeah, the and the problem with that analogy, like I said, we are creatures, we're time-bound, we're temporal, and you don't have to be a father to be human, and you don't have to be a husband to be human. This is not required. So we have the potentiality of being husbands or wives, if we're women, 
and parents, but we don't need to actually or actualize those potentials to be human because you don't need to be a husband to be human. You don't need to be a wife to be human. These are potentialities so that, you know, if you want to get married, so be it. Child, so, uh, father, so be it. But my point was, even in the temporal created realm, what you said wasn't true, that if something is a source of another, that other must be later in time. That's not true. You were not a father until you had your firstborn. It's only when your firstborn existed, you were a father. But you were the source of your firstborn. But still, nonetheless, though you were the source, as a father, you're just as old as your firstborn. So if that's true in the temporal realm, why would that shock you when you now deal with a being who transcends time? Yeah. You with me there? Yeah, yeah. Let me give you another analogy from Scripture. Now remember, these are analogies. They're not identical to God. So I'm not giving you something that's identical to God because God just told you he's unlike anything in creation, right? Hebrews 1.3, what does Jesus said to be? Who be in the brightness of his glory and express brightness. image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by yes. himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeah. Okay. Now that word, brightness of his glory, apogasma. I always fail to translate it correctly. The word apogasma is only used one time here in Hebrews 1.3, but it's also found in Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom 7.26, where it talks about wisdom being the reflection of eternal light. Now, notice the word brightness. The imagery is of a shiny object that radiates light. So imagine the sun, S-U-N, right? Sun. In this analogy, who is the sun, S-U-N? The father. You got it. So the Father is S-U-N, right? Correct. But Jesus is the light, the brightness, the radiance from the Son, right? Correct. So what's the source of that light, that brightness? The Father. The, the Father. But since it's the radiance, the brightness of the Father, that means it's the same essence because the Son emits radiance and light from its own essence and substance. So what comes to us from the Son is not something of a different substance it's the same substance right correct but the sun is the source of that light now can the sun in the sky be an actual sun if it doesn't always have its light its its radiance and heat no so notice though the sun is the source of the light the sun cannot be the sun without its light so the light has to always exist with the sun to be what it is right Correct. And that's your analogy. The Father is the Son. The Son is the radiance of the Father. But the Father cannot be the Father without the Son. So they're both dependent. One is dependent on the other. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You see the analogy here? Yeah. Just like the Son, S-U-N, in the sky can only be what it is if it's always existed with the light that it radiates and the heat. And couldn't be the sun without them because then it'd be a supernova, it'd burn out. Likewise, the father can only be the father and the true God when he's always in union, inseparable unity with the sun, his radiance, and the Holy Spirit, whom we do liken to the heat. So here's yeah. the analogy of source, derivation, without implying that one is older than the other without applying that one is greater than the other, because you can't have one without the other. Right. That, ma that makes sense. That's a good analogy. This is the analogy used by the fathers based on the scripture. That's where you get in the Nicene Creed, light from light. Right. True God from true God. Because he's the light from God the Father, who is light, the radiance of that light. That's where they got it from. Hebrews 1.3. And then the other analogy, when it says exact image of his person a more literal translation is the word character exact imprint exact duplicate exact copy of god's being hypostasios that later on that word hypostasios took on the technical me meaning hypostases of person but originally hypostasios where we get hypostases meant substance now notice again source and derivation jesus is the exact copy exact copy imprint of god's being so who's the source of the being the right. father right? The, the the father but for jesus to be the exact 
representation and copy. He cannot be a creature because a creature is temporal and finite and you cannot be the exact duplicate of a being that's infinite and uncreated because part of God's being is to be uncreated, eternal. An essential attribute of God's being is to be without beginning, no end, all powerful, all knowing. And here the author says Jesus is the exact duplicate of that being. Whatever God's being is, he's the exact duplicate thereof. Meaning it's the, the, the father's being, that's the son's being, that the son possesses in all its fullness. Well, for him to be the exact duplicate of God's being, an essential characteristic of God's being is to be infinite, uncreated, beginningless. Then Christ can't have a beginning and he cannot be temporal. Then he wouldn't be the exact copy. Right. So here you have the equality of the father and son, but one is the source. Without this implying that that which derives that essence from the sources later in time. He can't be later in time if the exact imprint of God's being. Because, like again, God's being, the essential aspect of God's being is that God's being has no beginning. And it's infinite, not limited. Well, for Christ to be the exact imprint, the exact copy, the exact representation of the being, he cannot be a creature who has a beginning. Then he's a very poor copy, not an exact copy. Got it. And the word character is never used of anyone else but Christ. But nowhere in scripture is any creature said to be the character, because that means an exact imprint of God's being. The word character is unique and used of Christ alone and the scriptures.